<laughs> Welcome everybody. We'll go ahead and get started. Delighted to see you all out on a Friday night. Um, thank you for coming. This is our uh, how many annual World Catholicism Week? Conference is now really a weekend, but it doesn't sound good to say World Catholicism Weekend, so keep, keep calling it World Catholicism Week. But it's our opportunity uh, each year to have a conference on a different theme and bring in people from all around the world uh, to talk about uh, Catholicism and a, a particular topic. Uh, and it's a sign of the, the unity and the diversity of the worldwide uh, church and the kind of friendships that we create at these events, I think, are are really important for fostering our mutual understanding. So thank you for uh, for coming. Um, we we also uh, usually produce a, uh, always produce a, a, a volume uh, from the lectures of the course too. So if you're interested in the previous years and missed them, uh, you can always you know, find them in book form, uh, or if you have the patience on video uh, on our uh, website as well. So, what's that? There's a book table. And there's a book table, of course, with, uh, thank you, Mike, with all the, uh, the books from previous conferences uh, out, uh, out here as well. So, um, yeah, thank you. Um, Nonviolence is the topic of this year, and nonviolence is not just the lack of violence. Um, it's not just being against violence. Everybody's against violence. Everybody wants peace. Nonviolence is... Um, the commitment to not using violence, even when not using violence, uh, doesn't promise to be very effective. Even when it's not going to work, um, nonviolence is the commitment to not uh, not use violence. And so there's something deeper than merely pragmatic considerations of what's going to work and what's not going to work. There's something um, in the commitment to nonviolence that has to do with truth what's really true and what's really at the basis of the universe, is it chaos or is it love? And so uh, what you think about the nature of God and so on informs what you think about this topic of nonviolence. So we'll be exploring that um, through, the, through the course of the, the weekend. There's a certain reason why this comes at this point in history. There's a certain kind of momentum in the Catholic Church about talking about nonviolence the early church for the first few centuries was nonviolent, uh, did not participate in the military and so on. Around about the fourth century, you begin to get um, active participation in the military with the kind of conversion of the Roman emperor to Christianity. And um, the just war tradition has been a major uh, note in the Catholic uh, tradition for many centuries. But in the 20th century, this begins to be explored anew and you have little moments like uh, World War I, you have four Catholic conscientious objectors in the United States, including Ben Salmon, uh, whose case is up for canonization now. Lonely voices opposed by both the fellow Americans and by the church, but standing up and saying, no, I, I follow Jesus and, and I, can't, um, I can't do this. There were many more in World War II under the influence of Dorothy Day and the Catholic Worker. And Vatican II officially recognizes the um, possibility of conscientious objection to military service um, in Gaudium et Spes. And this is uh, in part the work of uh, Eileen Egan and Dorothy Day and other uh, peace activists. And um, this tradition has gained momentum. Cardinal Ratzinger, before he became Pope Benedict XVI, um, questioned in an interview whether there actually even can be such a thing as a just war anymore. And those comments kind of caused a certain amount of stir. Uh, Pope Francis issued a statement on World Peace Day uh, 2017 uh, Nonviolence, a style of politics for peace, I think is the subtitle. But again, a, a very deep reflection on nonviolence. And then um, the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative, um, of which uh, many people in this room here um, have been a part, uh, has also has met in Rome a couple of times as recently as a few weeks ago uh, in an effort to kind of get uh, Pope Francis to issue an encyclical on nonviolence. 
and as a way of deepening, deepening our reflection uh, on these themes uh, as well. We have a couple of uh, tables I want to point your attention to as well. Pax Christi International has really been at the forefront of this effort of discussions of nonviolence in the Catholic world. And so Pax Christi has a table uh, here with all kinds of information uh, that's available. Uh, and so I want to um, uh, give a shout out to our friends from Pax Christi and uh, encourage you to stop by the table and uh, see what they've gotten and talk about that. And we also as well have a table, um, uh, our, our new friend Greg um, has a table of uh, materials from uh, Father Emmanuel McCarthy who has been um, uh, a longtime advocate of nonviolence within the Catholic tradition. Uh, books, pamphlets, articles uh, uh, by Father Emmanuel McCarthy, so I'd encourage you as well to stop by at some point and take a look uh, at what Greg's got uh, on the table there. So thank you all for coming, um, and now uh, Ken Buttigan is going to introduce our keynote speaker. Ken, uh, uh, one of the prime movers movers and shakers in the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative and uh, professor here in the uh, Peace and Justice Program at uh, DePaul. So um, please uh, join me in welcoming Thank you, Bill. The Catholic Church, in spite of everything, is slowly returning to nonviolence. One of the signs of this shift is this very conference. I'm grateful that DePaul University is joining with a growing number of universities around the world in re reflecting seriously on the nonviolence of Jesus and what it means for the church and for the world today. Another sign of this evolving shift, which Bill just referenced, is the international effort to call on Pope Francis to share with the world and the church an encyclical on nonviolence and just peace, organized by Pax Christi International and its Catholic Nonviolence Initiative. Some of us at DePaul have been part of this growing movement, including the Center for World Catholicism's Bill Kavanaugh and Michael Buddy. CNI has now co-sponsored with the Vatican two powerful conferences on nonviolence, including one just a month ago. In addition to this, many of the presenters at this DePaul conference have participated in a global research project that has produced a text that might potentially serve as a resource for an encyclical or major church teaching on gospel nonviolence. It's entitled Advancing Nonviolence and Integral Peace in the Church and the World, Biblical, Theological, Ethical, Pastoral, and Strategic Dimensions of Nonviolence. But a third sign of this nonviolent shift predates both of these initiatives, and that is the work of the community of Santa Gidea. San Egidio is a community of prayer, service, and tremendous peacemaking, and has a presence in 70 countries. It was founded in 1968 in Rome. We are grateful that our first keynote speaker at our conference is Dr. Mauro Garofalo, San Egidio's international relations officer, who works closely with the Vatican, with governments, with international institutions, and organizations. Since 2008, Dr. Garofalo has assisted in, in a number of international rescue operations in Afghanistan and Senegal. He has also participated in and contributed to various peace actions in Africa, the Middle East, and East Asia. Tonight he will speak on the topic, Peace is an Open Workshop, in which he will discuss Santa Gideos nonviolent approaches to conflict resolution that has been used around the world. Nonviolence calls us to acknowledge our violence and to grapple with it, to grow beyond our belief in violence, to break the cycles of retaliatory violence, to pursue nonviolent options, and to put our nonviolent power and potential into practice in our lives 
and in our world here and now. We try to live nonviolently because this is the way God wants us to live. The results are in God's hands. At the same time, nonviolence in our lives, in our church, and in our world can open powerful and creative opportunities for ending violence and for nurturing the seeds of a culture of peace. So in my experience in the times that I've been able to go to Santa Gidio in Rome, that you see that spirit and that power and that presence. And they even have a really great restaurant in Castevere, uh, the restaurant of friends. And I highly recommend uh, the pasta there. It's fabulous. Italian pasta. <laughs> Dr. Garofalo and his organization have been doing this, planting those seeds of peace for decades. It's an honor to hear from Mauro Garofalo at this conference on nonviolence. The last 20 or 30 minutes of our session will be devoted to questions. We ask that you save your questions until then. And we ask you to use the microphone in the center for that purpose. With that, let's welcome Mauro. It's my honor to be here and I First of all, thank you, the organizers and of the Catholic Week for inviting me. Uh, also because this is my first time in Chicago and it is a good chance for me to, to visit this beautiful city. But put away, Sentire said, you hear well? Put away your sword. What a great subject for a conference. And it puts us exactly in the, in, at the center of the Gospel of St. Matthew, during the Passion. And the question is why the disciples did not understand. They were tired, they were sad, they could barely stay, stay awake. And in, uh, and in this topic moment, the prayer of the Olive Mount, violence entered in the form of a mob with swords, with clubs, led it, led it by someone who, knew, who they knew very well, Judas, who had always been with them. But all of a sudden, all of, all, of, all of a sudden, sadness and tiredness give up to rage and violence. And violence came. And it was Peter, the leader for those twelve, who struck the servant of the, of the priest, of the high priest. It was not the first time in three years of following and listening to Jesus that Jesus clearly rejected violence. Just a few hours later, during the Last Supper, Jesus was clear to his friend that they were presenting to him two swords. And he said, enough, enough, that's enough. And this enough is one of the key words in the gospel, enough. And then before he said, but I say unto you that you resist no evil, etc., etc. Um, turn, uh, turn to him the other cheek also. It is not necessary for me, it's not my job, my task to insist on that point. All along three years of his public life, Jesus has always been very clear, but this, the disciples give, gave way to violence, and eventually they flee from Jesus in the, most, the moment of need. And, but I did not came all the way from Rome to preach on the gospel. I'm not a priest, not a theologian, and we had already the, the Holy Week. <laughs> and maybe I am the only one during these uh, three days of conference who is not a professor nor a theologian. My, I came all the way to tell you about the story of the community of Sant'Egidio, which is a community. Our moderator already said something. It tries every day to put the gospel at the center of its life. The gospel meaning also the gospel of, of peace and the gospel of non-violence. So at the first part of my intervention, I will try to explain very briefly what the community of Sant'Egidio is. Very briefly, because I cannot resume 50 years of history in 40 minutes. It's, it's impossible. In the second part, I will say why a Christian community such as ours got involved in mediation and conflict resolution, starting from zero, because we were no mediators at the end of the 80s. And this is to say why we, we have chosen this title, this uh, subject to this, to, for the conference. Peace is an open workshop. 
And in the third and last part of my hopefully brief intervention, I will try to underline some aspect to say more concretely where we are, what we do, together with some notion of our methodology in conflict resolution. Some situation and some scenarios that we mentioned are still going on, so you will forgive me if I'm not too detailed and specific. So, just to be more confidential. So, let's go to Sant'Egidio. Some of you are, have uh, visited. This is a Trastevere, a lovely neighborhood in Rome. This is a small uh, monastery, a convent for Carmelitan nuns that used to be a very strict cloister. Nuns could never go out. If they were called by the people of the neighborhood that buried the live nuns. <laughs> <laughs> and now it became the headquarter of Sant'Egidio in 1973. And we actually squatted the place because the place was abandoned. So we gave new life to a Christian building. Um, it is now a very touristic place. The community of Sant'Egidio started, as our moderator said, in 1968 in Rome. And it was a small group of high school students, younger than the students of this, of this university. This first group at the time decided to... We were in 1968, a uh, year of, of pro movements, protests, riots. But they decided that, true, the world had to change. But first of all, we had, we, they had to change their hearts, first of all. And they had to put the gospel at the center of their life. And to better explain what Sant'Egidio is, I, I should use the words of Pope Francis. Because Pope Francis, during his, his, his first visit to Sant'Egidio, and we were in uh, 2014, just got elected, he said these words, in some countries, suffering from war, I'm quoting, you try to keep the hope of peace alive. Working for peace does not give rapid results, but it is a work of by patient artisans who seek what unites and put aside what divides. As St. John 23 said, and then he had it. Go forward on this path. Prayer, poor, peace. These are the three main vocations of Sant'Egidio, prayer, poor peace. And the three elements, the three vocation of Sant'Egidio stands together. You cannot imagine a member of Sant'Egidio, such as I am, that work for peace and do not serve the, pray, uh, the, the poor. You cannot imagine a member of Sant'Egidio that go to the poor but do not attend the prayer. It is impossible. The three of them stands together. So, the prayer, this is Pope Francis, when he was saying that, exactly the words. And, uh, and that's the church. The prayer. Mm. Prayer is the heart of the life of the community of Sant'Egidio and it is an absolute priority. At the end of the day, every community of Sant'Egidio, large, small, gathers around the Word of God. The Word of God and the prayer are in fact the very basis of the whole life of the community. The disciples cannot do other than remain at the feet of Jesus. So, and then, the poor, why I have chosen this image, I will explain to you later. The poor are, for us, not a social target. Poor are brothers and sisters, friends of the community, members of the community. Elderly, homeless, migrants, disabled, street children, <coughs> minors in the peripheries, prisoners. These are our companions. The first student, back in 1968, met around the Word of God and they felt that the gospel was calling them to be close to the poor. Our area, our dream was to change lives of the least, of the last of in society by offering them our presence, a profound affection, and a second chance in life. Since then, this friendship has stretched out to other poor people, children in institutes, lowly and sick elderly, physical and mentally disabled, the restaurant, as was mentioned by the, the moderator, people living in the streets, terminally ill, prisoners, gypsies, migrants, lepers, and people with HIV. Through the year, the community has developed a way to be sensible to all forms of poverty, whether old, new, or emerging. And I've chosen this image because this is the day of Christmas. And the basilica, you are saying, is the same basilica in which we do the, prayer, the evening prayer, the central one. And it becomes, immediately after the Christmas mass, lunch, saloon to spend the Christmas lunch with the poor 
and you may say this is a showcase for Sant'Egidio. No, it is like this wherever there is Sant'Egidio. And last year, I am proud, just to put some numbers also, that 250,000 people had lunch during the Christmas day in a church like this, in other churches, wherever we are. And uh, I mean, during Christmas time, those who are alone are even more alone. So let's spend the, the time with our people. So this is the, an image of Sant'Egidio. So, the community of Sant'Egidio identifies itself with all these people who are, without exclusion, part of the community. The service with the poor is rooted in gratuity and voluntary work because we are all volunteers. No one is paid in Sant'Egidio. So, about this friendship, let me quote again Pope Francis, who said to us, who help is confused with who is helped in a tension that became an embrace and the protagonist is the embrace in itself. So, this is to, to tell about Sant'Egidio. I should add that we are now, the first group were made by 10 persons, now we are 70,000 members in 73 countries, etc., etc., etc. But maybe it's not, uh, it's not necessary for me to say the whole thing. I would love to switch now to the second part of my intervention, which is peace is an open workshop. Who said that? First of all, who, tell, who told us that? It was John Paul II. I don't know if this is the, the, real, the image when he was telling this to us, but for sure this is an image of a young John Paul II who was telling to a young group of Sant'Egidio, the founder and, and Don Paia, now Archbishop Paia, something. So I have chosen this image. But he, he said to us, and of course, this is our founder today, so we are still, still with us. Peace is something so important that it could not be left only in the hands of professional mediators, politicians or diplomats. It's something so important, so essential, that requires contribution from everyone. Common people, men and women of goodwill, believers, entrepreneurs, academics, students, Everyone, and I mean everyone. And it was a great, a great, a great uh, inspiration for us. What John Paul told us, uh, because we were at the end of the eighties when he told us this sentence: "Peace is an open workshop." Because that group of students at the end of the eighties already was expanding the presence of Sant'Egidio all over the world, and it Sant'Egidio was becoming more and more an international presence which meant that communities with communities all over the world, war, violence, suddenly became not a strategic thing or something that we could read on book, but a real presence in our life, in the life of the community, not something heard from our grandpa that used to be a soldier in the in Second World War II. Brothers and sisters of the community of Sant'Egidio were affected heavily by war. And it became a, a true reality with members of, of Sant'Egidio killed by war in Mozambique, where there was our first community in Africa. Mm. We realized two things. First of all, it was impossible to help poor people through our communities or to help even our communities in Mozambique because of the war, because everything is lost with war. Second, war is not a theoretical thing, it's a wound on the skin of the community of Sant'Egidio. So, doing something was already compulsory, was a, a call from our brothers and sisters. So, that's how we got involved. And Mozambique was a strange adventure because it was a, a civil war going on since more than a decade with a million death toll. It was a, 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 a a war between an Afro-Marxist government and a rebel, no one knew anything about them. The Barbudos Armados were called. Someone here speaks Brazilian, so <laughs> the birded bandits, let's say, financed by the South African apartheid, by Botswana, etc., etc. So we decided to do something for that war because it was necessary to do something and no one was paying attention to a conflict with more than one million deaths. Because, because it was a fruit of the Cold War, because uh, it is a, a peripheral effect of the apartheid system. This was all true, probably, absolutely true. 
Nevertheless, we had brothers and sisters and we wanted to help the people, so we got involved. And first of all, we got involved to protect the church, because uh, the Frelimo government was an Afro-Marxist government, so why not persecuting the church? It was uh, wise, according to them. So through uh, various co uh, co um, talks with the Italian Communist Party at the time, who influenced the um, Mozambique Communist Party, we managed to, mm. uh, to grant some f space of freedom for the church. Then we came in contact with the guerrilla. The story is long, just to be very short. 27 months of negotiation, confidential. Of course, with the help of some governments, the United States governments, the Portuguese government, former colonial power, and um, the Italian government who, host the, uh, who gave us the visa for the rebels, for example, which is not an easy thing, even today. In, our, in that small convent, we, we literally locked in rebels and government with some stops and while the war was still going on. But at the end, the 4th of October, day of St. Francis, peace agreement was signed. And all of a sudden, the world realized that there was a thing called San Egidio, how it happened. Mm -hmm. uh, the journalists during, this is a moment, one of the final moments. You see Gebuza then became president of the Republic and uh, um, Dlakama, the leader of the rebels, shaking hands for the first time in the monastery of Sant'Egidio. And the, the bishop smiling is the late Archbishop of, uh, the bishop of Beira, one, the one who first asked Sant'Egidio some help because uh, the government was persecuting the church. But journalists and international media became aware of Sant'Egidio and said, how did you change yourself? You were, we knew that you were helping poor people in the outskirts of the cities. Now you became mediators when you change your vocation. Again, we never changed our vocation. It's the same vocation. Helping the, because the truth is, and Professor Riccardi said it very, very clearly, that war is the mother of all poverty. And there is a strict link between conflict resolution and the law for the poor. So this is to say how it begins. Mozambique, the end of the 80s. Let me go back to the sentence of Pope Francis. A patient craftsmanship. Peace, making peace is a patient craftsmanship. Not only made by mediations, negotiation. Peace, and this I want to stress very much, is lived at all level by the members of our community. It is not by chance that many activities of Sant'Egidio uh, comes under the name of peace. For example, the School of Peace. This is Ecole de la Paix, School of Peace. School of Peace is the after school, a free after school for children. And in some cases, like this one in, uh, in Burkina Faso, uh, is the only school they attend. And it's the first activity of Santa Gino, meaning that you gather, you, you gather children around and you teach them. It was the first service to the poor of Santa Gino. It was my first service with the poor of Santa Gino. Uh, where children, adolescents from all over the world, from every faith and ethnicity, study together and learn the beauty of living together and growing together in friendship. This is peace building also. And I think also to the people of peace, which is a strange thing. It is a movement of former migrants, former refugees, that were welcomed by Santa Gita, not only in Italy, also in Belgium and in Mozambique, whatever. And then became, um, became also sort of member of Sant'Egidio. They come from uh, different ethnic groups and different religions. Um, and we, often with difficult stories of sufferances, but next to the community they find the strength to become themselves promoters of hospitality and friendship. Um, and then of course I should mention also, to repeat again and again the word peace, this is the, the march we do every 1st of January, which is the Day of Peace, International Day of Peace for the Church. We do this wherever there is a community, the 1st of January. This is the one that goes from Castel Sant'Angelo to the Vatican to attend the Angelus on the 1st of January and the, the blessing. This is one in Albania, where there is also a big community of Sant'Egidio. These are a few examples. The life of the community of Sant'Egidio wants to represent a prophecy of living together. Because it is precisely the crisis of living together that is at the origin of many conflicts. 
in everyday life, those who say, those who say they are from Saint Egidio tell the world, yes, we can live together. Yes, the complexity of the world in which we live does not scare us. And this is the case of many communities around the world. I think about members of Saint Egidio in Rwanda or in Burundi, in the Great Lakes region, Tutsi and Utu living together, but also the communities in Russia and the community in Ukraine. They are friends among themselves. And I, we always proudly say that our evening prayer in Moscow and our evening prayer in Kiev and elsewhere in those countries, it is not a prayer for victory. It is a prayer for peace. We do not pray to defeat someone else. The Christian have, has no enemies. So only by learning the art of living together, peace can be built. And let's say that after Mozambique, many other countries came to knock at our door in, uh, in Trastevere, that small monastery you saw, Algeria, with different results. It was more difficult. But then Guinea Conakry, uh, Burkina Faso, Niger, Guatemala, etc., etc. I will give you the full list with the map as soon as I go back to the map. But Sant'Egidio became an independent international subject, recognized by various states, an international organization, and it was called, was nicknamed by a journalist, the small UN of Trastevere, because well, it was exaggerating, of course. But it is, it, it truly built a credibility, and to do something also that generally is reserved for politicians and diplomats. And even though we are not, and we never became professionals of diplomacy, or, but only people engaged in dialogue at all levels. And now we can go back to the map. This is a rudimental map, and I do apologize, but I did it very quickly. Just to tell you where we are. In the red, with a, a lot of presumption, is where San Tegidio is present. And in the green and blue lines, we have the um, past and present intervention for peace. The current are those in uh, blue and the past were those in green. You may say, why there is a blue line on uh, North Korea? Because we do work there as well. <laughs> and I've been there three times too, with delegation of San Tejito to help orphanages and uh, elderly house, because the situation there is quite terrible, as you can imagine. But, mm, <laughs> so where are we doing things right now? Especially, and this is the third part of our intervention, which will be a little bit longer. Um, especially, we are working on three or four different um, scenarios. The first of all is Central African Republic. Central African Republic, you may know, it is a country which is experiencing a lot of difficulties since 2013. It is a country that has always been in difficulties since the independence in the 60s. And uh, it is a country in which uh, there have been uh, 16 coup d'etat. So the ordinary way to become president is to, to kill or to send away the previous one. But now we have a, a democratically elected president, so it's a sign of hope. Um, let me show you some. This is guerrilleros from Central Africa Republic. Now, Sant'Egidio got involved in 2013. In 2013, I don't know if you are familiar with the Central African scenario. Some of you maybe. No. It is a small country. No, not small. It's bigger than France, but with only three millions of inhabitants. And it is uh, situated in a, diff in a difficult uh, neighborhood because you have Chad, you have South Sudan, you have Sudan, you have Cameroon, you have Congo and Congo Brazzaville. These are the neighbors. You can imagine. It is not exactly easy. Central African Republic was uh, um, in big trouble in 2013 when the president, Bozizé, was uh, ousted by a coup d'etat again, by the so-called Seleka, Seleka, which is an alliance of many groups, let's say Muslim, but there are many components in that. Uh, as usual, as it, it, it some, as it often happens, the, the international community underestimated the thing. Say, okay, it is the 16th, we had already 15, they will uh, 
they will play around the power, they will uh, share the, the money of the presidents and then it, it will go as ever. Unfortunately, that, one, that time was far more difficult, far more uh, dangerous because the, the group called Seleka was characterized as Muslim. And the Christians reacted with forming other armed groups, which called the anti balaka And then uh, a conflict that started as a power-sharing conflict became an inter-ethnic, interfaith conflict. And the situation um, was, under, was out of control for three years of violence. In that scenario, Sant'Egidio intervened. This is one of the examples. All of these people <coughs> sitting around us in Sant'Egidio Hall, one of, each of, one of them is a member of a, an armed group. And there are 14 armed groups in Africa, probably not one, just two. Uh, Mozambique was easier. One rebels, one government. It is more complicated. But it tells you about the fragmentation of, of the scenario right now. Um, so we started talking with the armed groups. We started uh, working with the religious communities just to do the sensibilization to to, to discuss with them. And since 2013, there has been a multi-level engagement of strategy in the country. First of all, I told you about the armed groups, trying to find an agreement, agreement that was found eventually in June 2017. Then, with the political parties, there are hundreds of political parties in Central African Republic, just to organize the election for a free, fair, and non-violent language during electoral process. This is often underestimated, but it's extremely important, especially in, in African countries which electoral process led immediately to violence. I'm not talking about civil war, I'm talking about riots, protests, manifestation that always cause death and violence. So also to work with political parties, to train them on the, a language of non-violence is extremely important. Then religious communities. You may say, but at least priests and imams were agreed. Well, not exactly. <laughs> even, even today, uh, as we speak, there are some, let's say, responsible of religious community to be very diplomatic that are against the agreement of peace, that are against the peace process, and it's a work of sensibilization that is going on with some difficulties. And now, as we speak, and I do, I do not go into details, there is an agreement in, that was signed in Khartoum, and we are working to, with the armed groups and with the government, with the help of, uh, this is the last day of the, of the agreement, in the garden of Sant'Egidio, the garden of the nuns. Imagine if the nuns could see this, <laughs> this now. Uh, this is the Minister of Foreign Affairs, and this is President Tuadera, who came to Sant'Egidio to explain the agreement in a, in a press conference. Um, and of course, Sant'Egidio is also engaged on a humanitarian level in a disarmament process. This is something new for us. But imagine, uh, 14 armed groups, small, middle, and big, with people with, with the only, in, in the only possession of a Kalashnikov, nothing else. They live on their Kalashnikov. Now you, they are tired of that life, I must say. They are willing to disarm. They go back to the disarmament process, United Nations, International Community Government, and they say, okay, you need a well-working uh, weapon of war or 10 grenades. Okay, I have eight grenades you cannot disarm, go away. It happens, it happens. So my, the temptation once was, okay, I'll buy for you two grenades. No, this was not possible, but nevertheless, disarmament is an important thing, offering the possibility to get away from violence, because it's wrong, they know it's wrong, but how they, put, they can, where is the program of social reinsertion, etc., etc., etc. So, uh, it is a new thing for us. We never did disarmament before, even at the time of Mozambique. We just did the agreement, and the disarmament was carried on by the United Nations. But now we felt that in Central Africa we should do something like this as well. So we are experiencing new ways. Other two um, engagement fields, just to tell you where we are working now. 
One is Libya. Libya, it is also to explain, um, it is almost impossible and Libya is a clear example of why the, the international community is failing. Because there is a United Nations mission, there is a mediation panel, there are a club of countries, friends of Libya, but everyone has an either agenda, including Italy, my country. So Italy, France, UK, Qatar, Turkey, Czech, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, blah, blah, blah. Everyone has a different idea on what should happen to Libya. And so uh, the, uh, the armed groups are profiting. On, on that. It was impossible for us to um, work on the northern part of Libya. It means Tripoli versus Tobruk, Haftar versus Senraj, the two head of the main faction in the north. What we are doing now is working with the southern tribes, Tuareg, Tebu, and we are working on local ceasefire agreements, ceasefires, treaties among tribes, among one city and another city, or the same city. This is something you, you may say, but you have to solve the overall picture, you have to solve the main problem. Yes, but in a country fragmented as Libya, even a small ceasefire in the city of Seba, for example, which is a 8,000 inhabitant city in the south, it's the capital of Fezzan, it is something that could improve the life of the people and could give access to humanitarian aid that could lower the level of violence in the society. It is very important. And by the way, Pope Francis said that we, we are living in a third world war in pieces. Mm -hmm. This is true, we don't know. It means, maybe, it means that we have to work for a peace in pieces as well. We should not give up on a single problem because there is a general problem to solve. Who knows? when Seraji Haftar will get will will arrive to an agreement. We don't know. Meanwhile, Tempo population and Tuareg population ask for our mediation and we are doing that. And I think it is important to follow every single path of peace that is presented to us without giving up on everything. Um, and that was Libya. By the way, you may remember that I quoted Niger before and Guinea Conakry. I'm saying Niger now because we were not an expert of the Tuareg population of Libya, but we were working with the Niger, Tuareg population in Niger, and Tuareg in Niger, and Tuareg in Libya are cousins. So the once one Tuareg from Niger told us, you should do something for our cousins in Libya because they are making war with the Tebu, which is another tribe. And so this is to say personal relationship of quality. Personal relations are important to this. It is not only a strategic <coughs> or a political problem. Then again, I would love to quote a third example, always in the region, because as you can see from the blue and, uh, and green lines, the vast majority of conflicts are going on in Africa, unfortunately. South Sudan. You may have still in your eyes the image of Pope Francis kneeling before the heads of the transition of South Sudan. Salvakir, Riek Mashar, Rebecca Gara. It was a shocking image. Even myself, sorry, even myself I thought maybe this is too much. The Pope should not kneel in front of uh, assassins, corrupted bandits. But this tells us how far is willing to go the Pope to achieve peace. This was a, a really an example. And South Sudan, of course, this mm, government of... South Sudan, first of all, it's a shame for us as Christians, because it's a country that became independent on the basis of Christian free from the Muslim oppression. And the day number two of the independence, finally free from the Muslim oppression, they started to kill themselves. So it's a defeat not only for the country, it's a defeat for all. Let's say, and no matter uh, Catholic, Presbyterian, or Anglican, they kill very willingly among themselves. Um, South Sudan is now it is another example of focus engagement because there is an agreement it was signed in Addis Ababa one year ago, no less than one year ago, but some of the rebels did not sign. And the reaction of the international community, well, you don't, you did not sign, you are a spoiler now. We will put sanction on you. Results, 
the lowering of violence that was, uh, um, let's say, an outcome of the agreement is coming back to violence, full violence, full scale violence, especially in the south of the country. So we are now confidentially working with some of these factions to get them back to the, to the framework of the agreement. And by the way, I'm also uh, very glad to say that after the retreat, all these leaders came to strategic to the same prayer some of you attended. And it was a, a moving moment. I was also very happy to see a panel on Pari de Taban, who was, uh, who was a friend of us since many years and is really an hero of peace for the, for the country. So congratulations to the students who, who did the panel. I have no certificate to go. <laughs> <laughs> I should go, maybe last, last, uh, last um, case I want to, to put here is Senegal, Senegal Casamance. I have a light here. It's here. See, uh, all of you have heard about Senegal. Not many of you have heard about Casamance, I guess. Casamance is a, the southern part of uh, of the Senegal country is the most fertile and most rich part of it, and it is affected by an independentist war that was going on since the 80s. By the way, the, the movement was founded by a priest, in the independentist movement, La Pedia Macum. Some uh, I see some some uh, nodding from the from the the audience. This movement, since the end of the 80s, paralyzed the southern part of the country. And still, many uh, regions are um, with landmines and cannot be accessed by, uh, by anyone. So, in, when Macky Sall got elected, we became official mediator between the MFDC guerrilla and the government of Senegal. Now, it's been seven years of negotiation right now, not a day-by-day -day negotiation. Once every two months, they come and they discuss. And you see, and you see, uh, you can say, okay, in seven years we, you did not achieve any agreement. In seven years, are you a little bit naive, maybe? Mm -hmm. Yes, maybe we are naive, but at the same time, in seven years, no one was killed. There are no fightings at all. There are some lesser agreements, and all the hostages have been released. I was there when they released uh, the last seven soldiers captured by the guerrilla. To me it's enough, not the enough of Jesus, it's enough, I mean, it's something. <laughs> um, uh, um, this is a low intensity conflict, but we, uh, we love to categorize conflicts and violence. I don't, I don't love this. A conflict is a conflict. If, uh, uh, if a farmer cannot go to the field because there are landmines, if uh, uh, tra if, uh, if truck uh, drivers have to pay taxes at every checkpoint, both from the army and from the rebels, this is not a society in which I would love to live. If children cannot go to school, it can be a low intensity conflict, but it's still a conflict. So, another, I could mention other conflicts, uh, Mindanao, etc., etc., but I see, I think that I have to go um, very fast to the conclusion. <laughs> Um, let me underline just some aspects of our methodology. First of all, uh, fidelity to a situation. The ability to maintain hope in waiting for new roads for peace to be opened. I just mentioned Casamance. Casamance, we had to wait 24 years to do something, because we knew even the Abed Yamagun, the fact. But it was not possible, because the president did any president of Senegal did not want to open a negotiation. We will defeat them. Okay, 25 years. When Macky Sall was elected, we suddenly saw a space and we got involved. But how to stay faithful to a situation for 25 years? And I should mention also Central African Republic in this part. I go fast. Uh, a lack of interest which means that we are accepted in complicated negotiation because we are not perceived as an instrument of this power, of that nation, of that international organization. 
As we said for Libya, the lack of an honest broker is a big problem for the negotiation. We, Sant'Egidio, we do not deal in natural resources, we do not deal, we do not have shares in any kind of economy. So, if you want to come to Sant'Egidio to discuss, you are very well, uh, you are welcome, let's say. <clears throat> and then complementarity, because uh, sometimes mediators are competitors among themselves. Sometimes it happens to have meetings of mediation among mediators to decide who, who, this, who do this or do that. It is just, it's becoming more and more complicated. But we are a track to example of peace, of conflict resolution. So we have to work with governments, international organizations, and other NGOs. Example, the green light of Guatemala, just not to be always in Africa. In Guatemala, there was a UN panel of mediation. There was a negotiation going on in the city of Mexico, Città del Mexico, and it was paralyzed. So, few meetings in Rome, in San Pedro, and others helped to unblock, to jumpstart the process. It was a small contribution, but we hope uh, that we contributed to peace. <clears throat> Finally, final words. Another element, but to me, I, I should mention also the importance of, of interfaith dialogue. I should mention uh, the, the work of interfaith and ecumenical dialogue, which is important in South Sudan and elsewhere. I should mention that Sant'Egidio is an humanitarian actor. So we are not only those who come do the mediation and also we stay in a country forever, hopefully. So uh, we are the ones who treat HIV for free. We are the ones who teach to the school of peace. So it is a credit to spend. There is a good name you can it has a pocket money to say, see who I am. And then, but I think the last element I would love to, which is also more related to the subject of this conference, is we have the trust that um, of, in the possibility of change for everyone. You, we can change. In the bot at the bottom of every heart, man's heart, there is a desire for peace. We have witnessed a change in the heart of man many times. A slow healing, a detoxification from that poison that is violent. And this is uh, an, a spiritual aspect of violence, of conflict resolution. That, what can I say? It is something that a special envoy of the United Nations should take more, more uh, care of, let's say. So, in conclusion, Everyone can change. We should heal the soul and the heart of men from violence. So not only peace is an open workshop. Peace is always possible. It is a conviction that comes from our 30 years of experience and a hope that guides the daily work of so many people. John Paul II was right. It's an open workshop. The, but the, we need a lot of workers, so feel free to apply. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Mauro, and uh, San Pagidio. What I'm going to invite us to do, if you would, if you turn to a neighbor, uh, if you don't know this person, we'll do a little conflict uh, transformation here. Uh, just share your name and what are the one or two things that you're taking away from this amazing example of peace and nonviolence. So let's take, a, we'll take about a minute or so and then we'll come back and then uh, we'll invite uh, questions. Uh, you all. So I will invite you if you have a, a question for Mauro or a, a brief comment. We have the microphone there that's going to help us with uh, with uh, the uh, longevity of this uh, workshop. And um, so. Uh, Please, uh, if people have uh, a comment or a... Uh... Now, how likely is it that, that the cyclical is on nonviolence by the focus or a major document will actually uh, be issued? Are you, are you optimistic about that? I hope so, and I join in prayer with you, but I have no idea. <laughs>
because it's not my area of working. I travel to Central I can tell you everything about Central Africa, but about the uh, 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 um, for a coming document from the Holy See, I, I really don't know. I hope so. I have two questions. Um, what is what is the community prayer life like on a daily basis? And the second question would be is how does each community support itself financially? I will answer immediately. Okay. The, the prayer of the evening daily prayer of Santa Teresa is very simple. It lasts for 30 minutes. It is some um, uh, hymn, uh, singing of the psalms, a reading, a small preaching, another, another hymn. That's it. But we try to keep it as simple and beautiful as possible because beauty is a part of the, everything that happens in a church. So the songs are quite good. I hope I'm a part of the choir. So <laughs> <laughs> advertising for myself, uh, for myself. And uh, it is as more accessible as we can, meaning that we try, especially in the center of Rome, to translate in different languages so that everyone can attend. If you come to Rome, you'll get a, an English translation. And that's it. Of course, a young and small community, let's say in Niger, cannot do the prayer every evening. So twice, three times per week. But in Rome, it's every day in many places, many, many places, and as well in other countries. Uh, there is also um, a streaming. So you, you can check by yourself on the website, www.strategito.org. <laughs> um, about financing thing. Uh, well, of course, a German, the German community of Würzburg has not the same problem of the community in Beira and Mozambique. Mm -hmm. We try to be brothers and sisters, meaning that those who are more healthy helps the other. But generally speaking, Sant'Egidio supports itself with the energies of, the, of it, its own members. Everyone contributes. Of course, for bigger projects and bigger action, we need foundation, donors, eventual governments. Just to tell you that I was mentioning HIV people people who are sick of HIV. We run a program to treat for free, because everything, everything is for free in Sant'Egidio. In Africa, they treat 200, 210,000 people under three treatment, real treatment, mm -hmm. and it's enormously expensive, and we need foundations, governments, etc., etc., etc. Uh, yeah, thank you for inviting us to San Egidio. I'm thinking of joining it, but I see you, you're not coming to our country. I'm welcoming you to South Asia, which is India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. Uh, my question is this, that you are using yes. Christian... Uh, India? India, Pakistan... There is Pakistan in South Asia. Bangladesh. Bangladesh and... Uh, not yet. Cambodia, Philippines, South Korea, yeah. Indonesia... But not. <laughs> I'm speaking as a... <laughs> the question is this. That very often the Christian discourse itself is considered violent. In the sense that Christianity has come into many areas in the world through the political processes, through colonization and things like that. Uh, and you know the whole thing of go to the ends of the world and convert, baptizing the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Very often this has been a kind of a violent... Uh, discourse. So what has been your experience with interfaith dialogue and what could be some of the possibilities? Just like uh, we are perceived, of course, as Christians, but above all, we are perceived as believers. And I have to say that in all the countries I mentioned, a big number of that is vast major Muslim majority countries. And things are going quite well with that. It helps a lot the fact that we establish a network of interfaith dialogue since the 80s. So, knowledge, friendship, and good personal relation with different responsible for other communities, other religious communities, is very helpful. Niger, 80%, 85% Muslim. Guinea Conakry, 70% Muslim. And I could go, could go on, on, and on. But the, an example that I wanted to tell you, to explain, it is an Asian example. Uh, Mindanao, the only Muslim island in the Philippines archipelago. No? You all know, we mentioned that today in the, in the awarding ceremony. We got involved in the panel of, ex, of panel of negotiation 
of uh, the Mindanao Peace Process, MILF versus government, as an uh, interfaith expert. Who, gave, who told us to go there and work for, uh, for Mindanao Peace Process? The Mohammedia, which is a large brotherhood, Muslim brotherhood in Indonesia, which is a dear friend of Sant'Egidio. We work very well together because we, are, we have communities all over Indonesia. We started to understand each other, to dialogue, and they asked to be involved in a conflict, not the Catholic government, the Muslim part of it. Just to tell you how personal relation and dialogue can overcome the difference of, uh, of religion. And by the way, the Muhammadiyah has 32 millions of members. It's not a small thing. We are a small thing compared to them. But through friendship and through service to the poor, we it was a way for us to enter in another scenario, more than the community in the Philippines in itself. Just to tell you that, and this goes with, uh, I should open this, the big window of the friendship between Sant'Egidio and the Halazar uh, University, the Sheikh of Al-Azhar, which is the biggest Sunni uh, authority in the world, that always attend the meetings of Sant'Egidio, and we are working together on a number of issues, including Central Africa, blah, 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 but this is too complicated. Comunque, it is a, uh, an added value instead of being a problem. Of course, the past is painful, not only for the Christian, but for others. But Christians are persecuted in Pakistan, and at uh, the same time, uh, we persecuted uh, the Indians. I know, but we have to take in the history into account, but at the same time, move forward, I think. Thanks, Mauro. That was a terrific talk. Um, I can imagine you're very persuasive, uh, and I'm wondering how you actually persuade people to lay down their arms. Could you say a little bit more about what actually happens in these sessions? You get all 14 warlords in Central African Republic sitting around the table. How do you convince them that um, they need to lay down their arms? Um, what, what actually goes on in, the, in these sessions? Two or three things. First of all, the first recipe is listening, 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 listening. You have to be extremely patient in listening to people. They could talk for hours to explain that they are right, that their struggle is an historical one, that they are defending their own people, which is sometimes also a bit, a small part of true. But listening is the first sign of respect. And uh, in this sense, when I was mentioning patience, I was not only talking about the length of a mediation, but also patiently listening to people uh, and not imposing any deadline to a talk or to a session, because it's not useful. It's not. That second is respect, always being respectful without going against the person, saying, you did this, I saw you did that, I saw that, etc., etc. So, uh, I, I don't know because every, every, every time is different. Every, every time is different. For example, when you talk to a Tuareg, which is a man of the desert in the south of Libya, uh, you have to adjust your language, you have to know the history, uh, you have to use a certain amount of courtesy as you do when you are in a tent in the desert. At the same time, if you we are talking with us, a man from Central Africa Republic, you have to use a language which is a French-like language with the prerogative of the state, with the, uh, la république, le chef de l'état, etc., etc., etc. You have to adjust who you are, but in the, in the language of respect and patience, I think. Then, of course, there is a certain amount of magic of the place, that monastery, the garden, Rome, which is a, an international city but still a reasonable city. Italy is not uh, something that threatens... Uh, <laughs> I mean, there is also the name of Sant'Egio. It, it means many, many things. But first of all, I would say listening with patience and respect. And of course, finding the common ground. In Mozambique, it meant belonging to the same family, for example. The same family of national family, sorry. But we could elaborate further and further. Thank you for the good work that is being done.
but I'm interested to know there are there is a violence many places, peace needed in many places. What criteria do you use to choose a particular place, particular people when you go for a mission? Two answers to the same question. First of all, uh, uh, in some cases, it's not us that choose to go here and there. It's a request that comes to something okay. It was like this for Niger, it was like this for Libya, it was like this for Mindanao. We did not decide to get involved. They asked us to do so. This is the first part. The second part of my answer is to be honest with yourself. I mean, is my engagement or my commitment to that situation going to play a positive role or is also another actor in the same uh, theater? Because if they ask now to some teacher, why you do not, do not get involved in Palestine-Israel conflict? To do what? Uh, something far out of our reach. So we would probably say no to that. So I would say this is the, the main impression. I mean, if we can play even a small but positive role in a, in a conflict, we would gladly do so. This is. Francis talks about having a movement. How do you see your group evolving into that, or are any groups you want to choose of going ahead with uh, something like what he's talking about? The movement of what? I did not understand. Sorry. What kind of what kind of movement for nonviolence or? or well, we, if you should, if you want to describe strategy as a movement from non, for nonviolence, I would say this is not the correct definition. We are not a movement from nonviolent per se. We are a movement for peace, and peace means also nonviolence. But I think it's there are so many crossing points that we should work in the same direction at any time. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So, <clears throat> one question. First, uh, I appreciate you saying that everything is lost with war. I think that's a really pivotal insight and hopefully will um, help the collaboration towards an encyclical uh, down the road. My question is also about the mediation strategy. Um, one of the things that many folks who do this are learning is that the more we involve civil society, particularly women leaders, in media, direct mediation processes and peace agreements, the more sustainable they tend to be. So I'm curious, like, how, how are you thinking about that, the role of civil society leaders, and particularly women, when it comes to doing some of these mediations with you know, multiple armed actors? For it depends on the in which stage we are on a certain conflict and which country are. When I show you the image of the 14 warlords, of course they were all men, of course. Um, and if if it is if if we are talking about a political confidential mediation with the, the responsible of the groups and the responsible of the government, it's not up to us to choose who's going to attend the mediation. Even though the government of Central Africa sent, sent us a lot of wise and very effective women ministers. Um, but this is only a part of the conflict resolution process, the, mediation, the political mediation. Uh, just to tell you that following the path of Central African Republic, to talk about disagreement in the different prefectures of the country it's a huge work, a huge amount of work with meetings, atelier, etc., etc. And in this sense, women are crucial. Always, if we go to the small villages in the provinces of Central African Republic, always half of the audience is made by women. The head responsible of different small local NGOs are women. And they talk at the first place, of course. Um, when it comes to mediators, it's another piece. Uh, the, 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 the room is almost empty, of, uh, completely empty of media, women mediators. There are very few of them. Very few of them. And I think this is also a problem that is, lies within the international community. You won't find many special envoys, uh, female special envoys, or uh, uh, special representatives, or uh, chief mediators, female. You won't find many of them, almost no. 
but it's not up to us. We move together. We are. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'd just like to know uh, what was Sante Gidio's experience of mediation before the Mozambique experience, so did the Mozambique experience sort of propel you through the media effect into this work. Then number two is, uh, we know that peace process is a very long process, um, and there could be a danger of overstretching and, and not keeping up with the process to the very end. So how does Sante Gidio manage to, to keep that how do you actually recruit uh, people who really know the context, who can accompany the context up to the very end of it? Thank you. Before Mozambique, uh, almost nothing, I would say, because Mozambique was the first very lucky, thanks God, providential experience. We had some small experience of mediation before that. For example, we had to uh, liberate some hostages in the Shuf, the mountains of Shuf in Lebanon, and in the mountain region between Kurdistan, the Iraqi Kurdistan and Turkey. There were some uh, um, Chaldeans, families that were stuck in between the, uh, the, 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 the frontier, the boundaries between Iraq and, uh, and Turkey, and we had to free them through Canada. It was a complicated mediation, but it was small compared to Mozambique. Before that, it's mediation between poor and rich in the city, I would say. Young and old uh, in the society, but still the same line. Um, about the overstretching, well, uh, for us it's a vocation, it's not a political mandate. We were not appointed. It's something that we choose for ourselves. So, of course, life is full of difficulties, but uh, if God helps us, we will keep on stay faithful to situation mm. so but also in this uh, I want to tell you one thing uh, a member of Sant'Egidio young old uh, in Rome is someone who breathes dialogue every day uh, that breathes the complication of the world uh, we love to the, com the complications we we want to we, we love to talk to find different religious communities to go in the outskirts so in this sense there is a training uh, uh, of life we breathe dialogue so it's not a matter of appointing someone else it's a matter of uh, service of uh, priority of service to peace in this sense it's more a spiritual th aspect of our membership than specializing someone to do the thing. Uh, we are plenty of candidacies within Sant'Egidio to work in the peace office. Your last answer, I think, started to answer my question, which was what type of formation, training, preparation people get? What does that look like? What does it mean? When do you decide this person is ready to participate in a mediation or a like, huh? We are afraid of uh, what we call professionalization. Right. Mm -hmm. We are really afraid of that. We do not want to become professionists. And according to Sant'Egidio, the best mediator is the one who has something else to do in life, not living on mediation. Mm -hmm. And it's also a problem of institutions that live on mediation, finding projects, resources, mm -hmm. maintaining huge structures. And we, we are very, we are very, non-expensive in this sense but but you need to be at least to have knowledge so in one sense who is asked to do this thing like myself in Sant'Egidio of course I have to to train himself to study to read to to learn languages uh, well, you started languages. talking about uh, being afraid of professionalization yeah. but so I, the question was about what type of formation preparation training whatever Hey, thank you. The other thing, especially in where we are present, the big, a big part of understanding a conflict, like not only reading, but get in touch and in tune, I would say, with the country, with the people, with the difficulties of a people. And in this sense, we start from a, a better point than others, because we are living there. We are brothers and sisters that come 
times two times to Rome that tells us we are constantly in contact with the country. So we are in tune. And this gives us a, 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 some floor, some ground floor to build something. Uh, to give you an example, uh, a couple of years ago, all of a sudden the crisis in, there was a crisis in Mozambique, especially in the north. The Frelimo went back to the bush, there were some attacks from one side and the other side. Before uh, the United Nations knew every aspect of that, we had people wounded coming to our center to the HIV. And we knew from the bushes, where in some villages there is Sant'Egidio, that there was armed faction going up and down. Something that you hear, that you understand from being there, from having brothers and sisters there. This is also part of our knowledge about the situation that I wanted to add. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and I think you started, some of what you just shared maybe touches on this, but I guess I want to ask, what is the, um, if you could say, this is the message of San Egidio for the world, or for us here in Chicago. What is the witness, the message, the, the hope, the, or the invitation for us? Hmm. Tough question. Please. Please. Uh, I'm answering on a, not as a head of international relations of Santegidio, but as a member of Santegidio since I was 15 years old. Oh. Read the gospel every day and pray and go outside the boundaries of your life and find poor people and serve them as your brother. That's it. <laughs> and let them be members of your family. Remember their birthday, celebrate their birthday with them, spend Christmas Day with them, go on holiday with them. This, the, the poor people you will find will enlarge the space of your heart, will defend yourself from egocentrism, from egolatry, and will be your advocate all over your life. Thank you.